Hey guys, Deepo here. Today I got a look at the Otago for you, the Tier 7 Japanese Premium Cruiser. It's the reward ship for the campaign that's currently going on. I got this ship on loan for a week and then it's going to be taken away from me, which is going to make me sad because this thing's a beast and I'll have to grind it out and then get it. Or if I accidentally purchase it again, as I'm prone to do, then <laughs> maybe I'll wind up with it early. I'm going to primarily, I got two games here for you. The first one's a short one, not necessarily the most well-played game for me in the ship, but it'll show you the offensive capabilities of the ship, and I'll kind of go over the stats and mainly focus on that. Second game, I got a, what I would consider a really good game in this ship, and I think it's kind of played how you should want to play this ship, so you'll get a couple different looks. Estuary, I'm playing this ship a little bit more stationary on this map. Now I have experimented back and forth and that was accident accidentally loaded with AP from the previous round. Uh, HE is really good as we'll talk about. And right off the bat we get hit in the side. So this is kind of the same as the Megami. If you get hit in the side you're gonna have a bad time. So this is not necessarily a new player friendly cruiser. But if you're good at armor angling and picking, you know, map positioning and map awareness and stuff like that. Extremely powerful. I've played roughly 10 games in this, so it's a little too early for me to be going, going around crowning at my favorite ship of the game. <laughs> but it's... I got a feeling it's going to be up there for sure. I'm really impressed with this ship. Cruiser players are going to absolutely love playing this ship, so... If you're into cruisers and you're kind of on the fence about this campaign, whether you want to spend the time grinding it out or not, I would definitely recommend doing so. This is a very sweet ship. Now, comparing this to the Megami, range is shorter, 14.7 on my build compared to 15.3 in the Megami. Reload longer, 14 compared to 13.2. Very long reloads on these Japanese cruisers. That's pretty prototypical. Right there you saw the torps. That's a key difference. Megami has two launchers, one on each side, that fire rearwards. This has four launchers, one that fires rearward on each side, and one that fires kind of mid to forward. So excellent torpedo coverage on this thing. And you'll see, I think in this game particularly, there's a lot of torpedo action in this. And going against Otagos, you need to be aware and... Um, respectful of the torpedo threat at all time. These things are dangerous. Now I'll, I'll skip ahead to the torps. No, I'll, I'll keep the torps. We'll get there. Hang on. Uh, going back to the guns. Torch reverse a little bit better than the Megami. Megami is 27.2. This is 25 on my builds. HE damage identical, 3300. And these are the same 203 guns, by the way. Same fire chance, 17%. Very high fire chance. Same AP damage, 4700. So, good guns, and you'll see, I think, throughout these games, we'll be switching to AP on broadside opportunities, particularly on cruisers. Battleships, it's more kind of situationally dependent. What are you shooting at? How far away are you? What are, you know, what's going on? Yada, yada, yada. But both shells, very dangerous. Um, the Otago, like the Megami, high DPM, very dangerous and kind of a glass cannon, so to speak. Well angled, it's durable. It's You're still gonna take some damage if you angle your shots, but you can protect that citadel by angling, and that's gonna keep you alive a lot longer. And you'll see in this game, I kind of make some um, angling errors and <laughs> so forth, which leads it to be a short game, as I mentioned. Getting onto the torps, though, you got the four by four, 610. So, same launchers, but again, they're configured differently on the Otago than the Megami. Uh, torpedo reload, 101, 101 seconds. So, you know, not quick by any means, but th they come around fairly rapidly, you know. I mean, you don't necessarily want to be within torpedo range all the time, because, again, this isn't a frontline brawler by any means. But the torps, you're usually going to have. Your ship facing, you know, whatever you're trying to torp, you're going to have one launcher most likely pointed at them or able to get on target with just a little bit of maneuvering. So the torps, like I mentioned, are quite accessible in that regard. 
10 kilometer range. Uh, 62 knots. No, 64 knots, sorry, on these. Which, um. No, 62, sorry. Get my uh, lines confused here. It's 10 kilometers, 62 knots, which, if you run the formula with the torpedo detectability, you wind up with a 9.925 reaction time, so. Not the greatest torps in terms of reaction time, but that's Japanese torps typically have a little bit more of a reaction time built in due to some of the other advantages. So, you know, as you'll see in this game here, you can definitely score some torpedo hits, especially if you're lining them up on battleships, which is going to be your most successful um, chance to hit. I think in the second game we actually get a destroyer, if I recall, but uh, yeah, the torps are definitely nice on this, and it is a... Uh, it is uh, one of the strengths of the ship for sure. Speed, very fast. 36.6 on my belt. 35.5 on the Megami, so even faster than that. That was previously the fastest ship at the tier. Turn radius, 790. That's really poor, and it's kind of, if you're in a parking situation, and here's why, you know, if you have a <laughs> destroyer that's launching torps at you, being broadside like this is gonna result in similar results so try not to do that as I've I've been taught the lesson a thousand times but apparently I still haven't learned it and I I guess I haven't mentioned yet but you've probably noticed I do you do have a heal on this you get actually three charges which is very nice but getting back to the turn race 790 so if you're in a parked position and you're trying to you know maneuver or react to something by starting and stopping. That turn radius kind of makes it hard to turn in some instances. Uh, rudder shift, decent, 5.8. Uh, the Megami I got it spec'd out with double rudder shift. This one I'm running concealment mod on mod slot 3. Um, so 2.8 compared to 5.8 on this. And I've actually gone back and forth with... Um, slot number two, the rudder shift of the propulsion. I'm still not 100% of what I want to do there, but probably go with the steering gears. And there we are, eliminated and taken out of the match. But detectability, this is kind of one of the main strengths. 9.8 on my builds compared to 11.5 in the Megami. That might be a little bit lower. I can't remember if I recorded the Megami with double concealment Swirsky on there or not. But extremely good detectability. And you'll see that in this next game here. So... That first game was kind of more of a parked, kind of not moving around as much, but again, we got a lot of damage, and it was a short game, so thought I could go over the stats. Here, we're on Trident, and we're going to play it more of an open water cruiser style. Now again, like I mentioned, I've played about 10 games, give or take. I've played about half of them, kind of finding an island, utilizing cover, um, attacking ships from that type of a strategic, you know, mindset and about half of them with uh, kind of more of an open water kiting moving around fluid floating like a butterfly stinging like a bee type of a deal and I think this is probably how you want to be playing the ship ideally I mean it is very fast maneuverability is pretty good like I mentioned earlier if you're angling properly you're you're still going to take some damage but you can mitigate how much you are taking and you'll be able to stay alive plus you got the heal which is going to keep you, you know, sustained for longer, allowing you to keep pumping out damage as the match progresses. And you're really going to be utilizing that excellent, excellent concealment by kind of moving around, shifting positions, kind of being, you know, either popping up in unexpected places, or if you get into a little bit of a heated spot where you're getting focused on by two, three, four ships, you can kind of just stop firing keep kiting away disengage and once you're out of that detectability range then you can just kind of wait for everyone's attention to meander and then resume your campaign of death and destruction so i will say this though if you elect to play a more stationary position and you can you don't necessarily have to pick one or the other you can change based on the situation but you are vulnerable in that because again you don't you can't be taking a lot of shots in this thing and so that requires you with a laser focus on your map and then just glancing at the screen to shoot or look around or whatever. But if your map awareness is not there and you think you're just going to park this thing next to an island, I mean, you're not going to last very long. So keep that in mind. But that's 
Part of the reason I like Makawa, I mean, I do like his concealment for the Japanese cruisers. And you can see, if you're unfamiliar with the ingenious perk, right now I got two ships targeting me, and that's what that little number is by the um, detected icon. That's going to help you out quite a bit. I mean, A, it'll allow you to know, like, do I need to be careful here? You can kind of try and figure out <laughs> who's shooting at you. Here we do have that DD in the smoke, and we get some torps on there. You can see, if you're kind of firing right off the side, you can get both launchers pretty comfortably on there. If you're going to shoot torps kind of rearward or forward, you're only going to get one spread per side. But, you know, again, if you're more broadside or whatever you're trying to torp, you can get two salvos off pretty comfortably there. So not a lot of maneuvering required to launch those torps. But here we got the Iowa kind of deciding he wants to kill us. So we need to angle against him, ratchet up the speed, and then we're going to just fiddle with the speed of your back and forth and kind of, you know, enticing them to miss the shots by making it harder to judge my heading. Now, that's quite a spread of torps going to that cloud for that destroyer, and he got on. You know, it's... <laughs> I don't know who else launched torps there. But if, it, if you ever get a cross pattern of torps like that, it's extremely hard to deal with. And, um, you know, it's... Unfortunate for him, but fortunate for us. And we remove one of two destroyers, which is very nice. And now, again, we're angled pretty tightly at that Iowa. To get all the guns firing rearwards, you don't have to be as steeply angled as forwards. You can, the gun firing angles are pretty good for both sides, but to get the back two turrets firing, you, you do have to open it up just a little bit, which is going to subject you to taking some damage. Now there, you see... Even though we are definitely angled well enough to not take a civil there. He's still able to punch through and get some decent damage. And I should be using this heal here that's a little bit slow on the uptake there. But, you know, maybe a little bit too stationary there. And maybe just needing to get away from that Iowa a little bit more. That's a dangerous ship. But here we do have another destroyer. We can see there's another cloud over there. And there's a King George in front of us. Now we did blast the I or the Atlanta there and get a few resets, which is very nice. You can see on the map here, they captured B, they're capturing C, they're capturing A. I don't it doesn't feel to me like anyone on my team's really concerned with what's going on in the game here. Um, you know, we do have kind of a black hole, everyone's sucking into a singular point in time and space, formation kind of developing in the back. Domination mode games, I don't really understand why teams all want to sit way in the back while the enemy just pushes forward. And you can say, well, what's up with you, Chief? You're doing the exact same thing. Fair enough. But, I mean, it just doesn't tend to work here. And I do want you to keep an eye on the score as this game goes on. And this is going to be kind of a good illustration of why letting... The Conceding two or three capture points in the game is going to cause you a lot of angst, consternation, sleepless nights, you know, restlessness, whatever. <laughs> but here we got the lightning popping out. Now, he was just kind of hanging out by that corner. I don't know if he was just waiting for me to rush the King George, which I'm not inclined to do as a cruiser, but a lot of cruiser players do rush battleships for one reason or another. And maybe he thought I would just keep pushing forward and attempt to torp me there. But I turn away just in case he did launch torps. I mean, it's very likely that he probably did. And any there we do see a, some evidence of him doing so. Usually when destroyers spot you, if they're within your range, most destroyer players are going to shoot you. And we did get him with the torps as well, by the way. So that's actually both destroyers we killed with torps. But getting back to my point... Most destroyer players, if you're within their range and you seem like you're kind of going in a straight line, they'll nine times out of ten just launch the torps as soon as it says you're within their range. And then if you immediately just go the opposite direction, they'll wildly miss like that. So, and to all but like really good destroyer players are going to tend to torp as soon as they have the opportunity to do so. Now that pattering sound that's kind of following me around is the golden shower just splashing all over the place. This Atlanta here behind the island, he thinks he's, you know, got it made in the shade. 
he's behind the island. He's just going to stay back there as far away as possible. Keep raining down his nastiness. But you can see these fire arcs. They're pretty horizontal, but you can also arc over some islands here. And unbeknownst to him, we're able to smack him around and put him at the bottom of the sea. So, you know, I, I like the arcs on the ship quite a bit. I mean, they're flat enough that your shells get there quickly and, um, you know, it makes aiming pretty easy. But you can actually arc over some, you know, terrain. As I attempted to do there, I would have loved to blab both of those Atlantas back-to-back -back kind of blind-fired <laughs> over terrain. But um, that one got away from me. But we've actually turned the score around in terms of ships. Look at the score, though. This is what I mean. We have a three-ship lead, and we're losing the game. And this is very easy to lose matches like this. And frankly, I mean, it took a little bit of effort on my part and a little bit of luck, frankly, getting some of those destroyers with those torps, which, you know, I mean... It is what it is. We were trying to torp them, but that's there's still a huge component of luck there. But I'm, I keep spamming, if you've noticed. Get on the caps, you know. Instead of sitting in the back doing nothing, get on the caps. And we've been clearing out the teammates. Now, one of our guys goes on C, which is good. That stops the point of cruel on that one. We're going to get on A here, and we do have another teammate. So, by getting both of us on here, we'll be, we'll be able to flip it around very quickly. But that gives me the option... If that Atlanta is still kind of hiding behind this island, I can just keep scooting forward here, attack him. Meanwhile, my teammate still flipping the cap and stopping the points, and then eventually we'll be gaining the points from these caps. And once you flip two, the game's effectively over, you know, barring massive malpractice. So it's very frustrating to lose games when you have a two, three, four ship lead, whatever it is. But it does happen, and by effectively spotting them the three caps right off the bat and saying, you know, we're so good, we can beat you no matter what. I mean, that's just a... I know that's probably not what nobody was thinking, but that's effectively what you're doing by conceding those um, caps like that. And it, it's going to cost you a lot of games, you know. So I always preach, you know, focus on the objectives in Domination mode because that's how the games are won and lost, typically, so... Trying to just eliminate the ships every game is going to lose you way more games that is going to that you should win than it's going to win. So that's my look at the Otago though. I hope you did enjoy it. If you did, please hit the thumbs up. New to the channel, consider subscribing. A lot of World of Warships coming all the time. Questions, comments, leave them below. Love to hear from you guys, and we'll see y'all later. All right, peace.